Thank you, Payal. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to Algebra. The last couple of weeks have been grim as we teetered on uh, the brink of a full-blown war with Pakistan, mourned our martyrs, tried to make sense of political rhetoric on war and the backlash against our own people, and struggled to separate fact from fiction as media reports grew increasingly unreliable and inconsistent. This evening, we have with us bona fide experts. Mr. A.S. Dulat, who has served as the Special Director of IB and the Chief of RAW, and after retirement as a Special Advisor to the PMO on Kashmir between the years 2000 and 2004. He has also written a book on Kashmir called Kashmir the Vajpayee Years, as well as another book on Indo-Pak relations called The Spy Chronicles that he has co-authored, in fact, with the former chief of ISI, Asad Durrani. Joining him this evening is Ambassador Kaval Sibbal, who's had an illustrious career as a diplomat, including having served as India's ambassador to Egypt, Russia, and France, and the foreign secretary to the government of India between 2002 and 2003, excuse me, and uh, on the board of the NSA between 2008 and 2010, and on the board of the US-India Strategic Partnership Forum. He is also a prolific writer. Please welcome Mr. Dulat and Ambassador Kaval. Sibbal. All right, I'm going to start with you, uh, Ambassador Sibbal, if I may, since Mr. Dilat is drinking water yet. Um, one gets the sense from your columns and your interviews that uh, you think that in retaliation uh, to uh, the Pulwama attacks, India's strike on Balakot was necessary in fa and in fact the right way forward. Could you share with us your views on what has been uh, termed by India as a preemptive non-military strike? Well, all of us know that uh, since the middle 1980s, uh, Pakistan has been bleeding us with uh, the arm of terrorism. And we've not found the right response. Uh, the, uh, after the Uri attack, we thought that we will change the game a bit and inflict pain on them in the way they have inflicted pain on us for the last uh, two, three decades. Obviously, they did not heed the message of the Uri strikes that we were officially willing uh, to cross the line of control in order to attack the terrorist uh, launch pads uh, in POK. Uh, you would recall that uh, during the uh, Kargil crisis, our Air Force had strict instructions not to cross the LOC because we ourselves felt that crossing the LOC might be a form of escalation. Now, I think they also missed the message from the Doklam crisis that India was willing to stand up and fight if there were attempts by foreign powers, even a powerful country like China, to, to try and uh, change the equation on the border. Now, after Pulwama, it was clear that we just not could sit back. For so many, on so many years, and I myself and I have been in office, we've been telling our interlocutors that if there is a major terrorist attack, uh, India will have to react. So this time, they chose to attack not only in POK, but in Pakistan proper, so as to send a very strong message to Pakistan that we have we are now willing to strike at the roots of terror. Now, I must say that we are, not a war, we are not warmongers. We are careful. We don't want to have a war with Pakistan. Therefore, we characterized our strike as a preemptive non-military strike at terrorist targets, and that the Pakistan military was not targeted, and we were very careful to avoid civilian casualties. So de-escalation was built into our reaction, and we put the onus on Pakistan to escalate if they so wished. So, I think the message has gone home, no matter the fog of uh, confusion over what happened, didn't happen, but the message is, is clear now that if today we could attack Balakot, tomorrow if there's another major terrorist strike in Jammu and Kashmir or elsewhere in which Pakistan is involved, we have the whole of Pakistan open for us to strike at terrorist targets, 
and one wishes and hopes that Pakistan has absorbed this message. I will come back to a couple of points that you've raised, but before that, Mr. Dulat, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but one gets the sense that you are a little bit more um, skeptical or perhaps ambivalent about this strike, and you said somewhere, and I quote, that the elections will be in the minds of certain people. That is also why I think something was going to give this time, and also why a response to the Pulwama attack was inevitable. Do you see these, uh, this strike as more of a political move than a strategic maneuver? Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, let me say that uh, this has been a gift from the Jesh and the ISI to Modi ji, because the timing is so good. Uh, yeah. I think it was irresistible at this point of time with the elections looming that um, something more than the last surgical strike, it would have to be surgical strike plus. And so that's what happened. The Air Force went in, which we have not done in the past, as the ambassador mentioned, and uh, we carried out strikes. So, uh, like the Foreign Secretary said the next day that, uh, well, we've done what we had to do and that, that's it. And uh, it uh, reminded me of the surgical strike in 2016 when the DGMO said, uh, you know, after the strike that uh, we've done what we had to do, nothing more is required. And uh, Pakistan said, uh, well, nothing happened. This time, uh, the, the initial response from Pakistan was that uh, this is, a, again, a lot of fiction. But the fact is that uh, the purpose was served. We had carried out a surgical strike right in the interior of Pakistan. And uh, it, it served the purpose. It, it sent a message. The only point I'd like to make, two things really, that uh, where I disagree with the ambassador, one is that uh, I don't think we can really take this as, you know, an example of what might follow in the future. Because every time the situation will be have, to, have to be assessed afresh. And it's not necessary that the next time something like this will happen. The second point, I think that we have crossed the line, which we never had did in the past. And so that moral high ground that India always had, I think that has been compromised to some extent. Now, uh, people will, will think twice or can think twice on whether to believe everything that India says or, you know, uh, India does. Uh, let's not forget that we are committed to uh, uh, not using the, the nuclear, uh, nuclear capability, no first use. So again, I think these things could come into, into question. But I think what needed to be done was done. I will ask you to clarify a couple of points in a bit. but and. Uh I think you'll get a chance to um, respond to some of the things he said in a minute as well. But before that, there's been a lot of debate. This is also something that you mentioned. There's been a lot of debate lately on what the nature of this strike exactly was and uh, why we still don't have all the facts, uh, what the mission was, uh, whether or not it was accomplished, to what extent and why not, whether the planes in fact crossed the LOC, and experts in media and, uh, you know, uh, officials in both countries have uh, been saying different things, which is but natural, but also a lot of things that, are, that is being said by the press abroad and experts in satellite imagery and so on and so forth, um, you know, doesn't quite tally well with one another. Is this a matter of concern at all, Ambassador Sipper? Well, I'll re remind you that uh, when Osama bin Laden was killed in this operation, uh, the Americans never showed the photographs of Osama bin Laden being killed. They said they had buried him in the ocean somewhere, but no proof was given. 
Uh, no details were given how they crossed into Pakistan airspace, what methods they used uh, to jam the air defense system of Pakistan, or whether there was complicity between them and the Pakistan military. They have killed a number of Taliban leaders, heads of Taliban in the past, without giving any details. So governments uh, do not always want to share details about their capabilities, their capacities, because that alerts the enemy, and next time, knowing what your capabilities are, they will try and develop counters uh, to that. I think it's a great shame that there are elements in India who doubt the word of the Indian Air Force, of the Indian Armed Forces. It's all right for Western countries, certain liberal elements in the press who have always had some very negative uh, thinking about uh, India, like, for example, the New York Times. And I must tell you, and I've been looking at it very closely, that there is an attempt by the think tanks, the media in the United States, to completely overlook the fact that an F-16 was shot down, because it has a lot of repercussions. And an F-16 shot down by an old aircraft and a Russian aircraft like MiG-21 Bison is a huge slap on the face of, of Lockheed Martin. And actually, it will put paid to the efforts to sell F-16s to India. So please, believe what the Air Force has said. They have been very careful, very professional. They have explained what they have done. And they have left it to the government to decide if they want to give more information on, on these strikes. And the government should not be pushed around into revealing things which ought not to be revealed, simply because, and that is a sad part, we have to convince our own public opinion that actually these strikes occurred. Mr. Dilat, very quickly, um, you have, of course, uh, headed India's premier intelligence agency. Um, do you think that uh, the public should, in fact, be pushing the government for these facts or that the government is right in saying that it has the prerogative to reveal what it wants to reveal at what point it wants to reveal? I think it's, uh, it's fair enough both ways, you know. The public would always want to know what really happened because uh, some doubts have been created, uh, particularly by the, the foreign media. But uh, at the same time, if, uh, if the government thinks that uh, certain facts should not be revealed, that's, that's fair enough. I, I would not challenge, uh, you know, what we have claimed, because uh, there has been a strike and the purpose has been served. That's the point I'm trying to make. Now, what actually happened, and I think the air chief put it extremely well, that we are not in the business of counting bodies. We were given targets and we attacked those targets. So I think we should accept that. Moving on, um, Ambassador, you have said, and I'm paraphrasing here, that um, a strong signal has been sent to Pakistan that uh, India is no longer willing to tolerate the proxy war. India is called the nuclear bluff, so to say. and uh, shown Pakistan that we're not going to be deterred by the fact that it has nuclear capabilities and that Rawalpindi now needs to do some rethinking. My question to you is that even if Pakistan were cornered, to what extent is it capable really of curbing terror and uh, controlling its non-state actors? I recall the conversation during the Kargil war and, uh, <coughs> uh, and uh, Raw had, or IB had intercepted that conversation where General Musharraf was in Beijing and he was speaking to his uh, chief of general staff, uh, who said, look, uh, we've uh, got these uh, tanzims uh, by a part of the anatomy that I will not mention, and that we will do, they will do exactly what we want them to do. They have always been under their control. They have nurtured them. They have uh, uh, given them uh, this mandate to go ahead and promote terrorism against uh, India, because they know that uh, this, is, this asymmetrical warfare has been very effective, and it has actually uh, caused a serious deterioration of the internal problem in Jammu and Kashmir over so, so many years. And the government does not know uh, how to handle this, because there is this whole business of non-state actors. We don't have non-state actors who can uh, actually go and uh, do similar kind of damage to Pakistan. So the state has to respond. And the state has been unwilling to uh, take the risk of uh, uh, responding for fear that it may get escalated. Because if we took a legitimate step, you can never say what Pakistan may do. And if they up the ante, we will 
be, be obliged to do so. So we've been acting responsibly. But unfortunately, f f it has gone on for so many years. Now, how do you just keep on saying that I'm a responsible country, I don't want matters to escalate, and s keep seeing that we, have, we are the victims of uh, terrorism by Pakistan? Uh, I think this time what we have really done is that uh, we have demonstrated that we are not going to be deterred simply by the fact that Pakistan has nuclear capability. Pakistan must remember we also have nuclear capability. So it's not as if they can escalate things to a point without taking into account our nuclear capability. And that below that threshold, there is scope for retaliating against Pakistan. We don't want to take the initiative to start anything with Pakistan, but we reserve the right uh, to react, to retaliate. And, and that space we have now opened up, and opened up very effectively, because it's not limited only to PFK. We can now attack anywhere. We can attack, I'm not saying we should, but we can attack Murit, Murit K just across the border. We don't even have to cross anything. We just send one of your Brahmos missile. You can destroy everything there. I think Pakistan has got the message. It has to do its uh, calculations anew to see whether they can take the risk of another, of, of, of promoting, provoking another major terrorist attack against India because India will be obliged to respond. Uh, Mr. Talat, you know, there's a fair amount of consensus on what ambassador, the ambassador just said that, uh, of course, uh, the Pakistan state has played its role in nurturing uh, non-state actors and extremist groups, etc. But are they still under the state's control? I mean, who is really running Pakistan, as per your opinion? Well, uh, uh, right now, I hope Imran Khan is running Pakistan. And uh, uh, we know that the army is all powerful there. There's no doubt about that. But uh, I think the good news is that, uh, you know, we started by saying that Imran is only um, a stooge of the, the military and, and things like that. I don't believe that. I don't think so. I think Imran is very much his own man. And if today uh, there is a good equation between uh, Imran and the army chief or, or Imran and the, the army, I think it's a positive development, something that uh, we should uh, look at and, and think about. Because, um, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons or one of the things we keep saying is, who do we talk to in Pakistan? Who is there to talk to in Pakistan? And uh, this doesn't, uh, doesn't really hold. Because either you want to talk or you don't want to talk. And um, there have been periods when we've talked and uh, when we've talked, um, it has benefited us, you know. I think, um, if I might say so, in the last 30 years, Musharraf has been the most reasonable of, of Pakistani leaders, even though, uh, you know, he was the villain of Kargil, no doubt about it. But uh, after that, I think he began to realize that uh, war was not an option. They tried it before, and uh, India was too big. So, uh, peace was a much better way to go ahead. Of course, uh, what did happen in between was 9-11, which was a watershed. And uh, Musharraf had come under a lot of pressure from the Americans. So, but as far as Kashmir goes, things improved considerably. And we had, if you look at the period 2002 to 2008, or even 2000 to 2008, it was a period of comparative peace in, in Kashmir. Again, the period uh, 2009 to 2014 was a peaceful period, post-Mumbai. Uh, and incidentally, Mumbai also happened just before an election. And at that time, the government resisted the temptation to cross that red line. I think you brought up a lot of points at once, and uh, I will come back uh, in a bit to talks and General Musharraf and, and you know, uh, the period of uh, relative peace. But uh, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, in fact, you ended up preempting, you have uh, had a fairly positive opinion of uh, 
uh, the, uh, of Imran Khan. And uh, I think uh, if I'm quoting you correctly, you even said he's a good man for India to do business with. How do you rate and uh, analyze his response uh, post Pulwama and Balakot? Very quickly, sir. I don't think you can fault him on anything post uh, Pulwama. I mean, you know, once uh, um, the Air Force went in, it was to be expected that Pakistan would re uh, retaliate. But uh, now things have calmed down. And I think uh, whatever way we look at it, of course, he came under a lot of international pressure. That happens immediately when India and, and Pakistan look like, you know, misbehaving from the international point of view. But I think it's, it was still gracious of him to, to send the wing commander back on the second day. He could easily have stalled it for a week or so. And uh, coming to Imran, my point always has been, whoever it is in Pakistan, you need to check out the leadership. You know, there's no point saying so-and-so is good for nothing, so-and-so is a weakling, so-and-so is a stooge. Check him out. And I recall a conversation I had in 2000 with the chief of the CIA. He had come to Delhi from Islamabad. And I asked him this question. It was uh, not too long after Kargil, and I said, Tell me, what is your assessment of, of Musharraf? And he said, look, uh, he's English speaking, he's whiskey drinking. We think he's going to be around for a while. You guys need to check him out. So I, I always remember that this thing. When, when there is somebody new and you have a doubt about it, the way ahead is to check him out. So check out him, Ram. And let me also add that I think Imran knows India better than any other Pakistani. He's been here about 35 times. Most of our senior cricketers have been personal friends of his. Sidhu went and, and got a hug or gave a hug the other side. So I think if you want to talk, there is an opening. Well, Mr. Khan is definitely English speaking. I don't know if he's uh, any longer whiskey drinking. But sir, on this count, you might be a little bit more skeptical. Uh, even before the Pulwama attacks, uh, I think you had uh, in a column warned India about expecting too much from uh, Imran Khan because you felt like he'd been propped up by the army and he's had uh, close links with a couple of extremist groups, including the Taliban. What is your view? Have you revised your view in uh, light of the actions and statements that he has made? Uh, post the Pulwama and Balakot strike? First of all, Imran Khan is not new on the Pakistani political stage. If you recall his attacks, strong attacks on Nawaz Sharif, calling him a stooge of India, accusing him of selling Pakistan uh, to India, etc., etc. Uh, we know him, we, we know what his thinking is, and it's by no means accidental that uh, he was given the moniker of the Taliban Khan. Uh, his whole views about terrorism, about the Taliban, about extremist groups uh, are very different uh, from uh, what generally people seem uh, to believe. Uh, that is one thing. The other is that, uh, look at the statements. He's constantly, constantly saying that Kashmir has to be resolved. Nothing else can move unless uh, Kashmir is resolved. He has not uttered a word on terrorism, even indirectly, that there is an issue of terrorism between India and Pakistan, that Pakistan has to address this. He is blaming the entire problem of terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir to uh, our mishandling of the uh, Kashmir problem. Even in his parliament speech, uh, he was accusing India of uh, doing this and said India must introspect. So, we will not talk about terrorism demands that uh, we must only talk about Kashmir and, and uh, that is, and unless a solution to the Kashmir problem is found, nothing else can move. So what do you talk to me about? What do you put on the table? I, I will not mention names. I met a very senior Pakistani official who has big responsibilities. And I posed this question to him. You are saying that give him a chance. He is new. He is this. 
First of all, tell me what is it that he has said which is new and which we haven't heard before? What Nawaz Sharif did not say in terms of wanting to open up with India, normalize with India, that the two countries must focus on poverty removal. The entire rhetoric that Imran Khan has is nothing new. We've heard this before. And number two, when you sit on the table and he says, look, uh, terrorism is not an issue, it's your problem, you are provoking terrorism. It's because you're mishandling Kashmir, our public gets agitated, and, hence, and I can't control them. In any case, they don't even admit that they have any terrorism in the country or any terrorist groups. The, their, Gafur, the head of the inter-services uh, public relations fellow, has said there's no Jashe Muhammad in, in Pakistan. And then when it comes to Kashmir, what do you talk about? He says, give me Kashmir, and we say, okay, take Kashmir. What do you talk about it? And I must mention here, since 1996, we have a composite dialogue with Pakistan. So it's not as if we are not having a dialogue with Pakistan in which terrorism, Kashmir, everything was on the table, including trade and people-to-people -people contacts. So we have been talking. All the issues that are on the table have been discussed threadbare, in detail, in detail between India and Pakistan, and nothing has moved, and terrorism continues. So why do we have the illusion that tomorrow if we start talking, somehow, somehow things will change and we'll be able to find a solution between India and Pakistan. There has to be a fundamental change in the mindset of Pakistan before we can actually hope for any stability in our relations. I'd like to pick up uh, very quickly on a point that you made several times uh, with respect to, in the context of uh, Imran Khan's statements, which is mishandling of Kashmir. Ambassador, uh, you have, in your view, uh, you know, the demand for self-determination in Kashmir and uh, the agitation on the ground, the stone pelting and the hartals, etc. You don't view that as a democracy in action and you've also spoken out against the separatists. Let's uh, forget about India and Pakistan for a second and talk about what, according to you, are some of the steps that the Indian government can take within Kashmir to resolve, well, maybe resolve is a big word, but you know, move the needle in a positive direction in the medium and long term. I think uh, the Kashmiri leadership, those uh, who actually <clears throat> have been the biggest obstacle in terms of finding some kind of a biomedia between the government of India and Kashmir are absolutely blinkered. They have no clue about what is good for them and for Kashmir. Let me give you an example. Take the manner in which China has handled Tibet or Xinjiang. They've interfered in the practice of religion. They have uh, made demographic changes. They have destroyed religious places. Uh, in Xinjiang, they put one million Muslims into re-education camps, et cetera, et cetera. Look at what we have done. There's no demographic change. There's no interference in the practice, religious practice of uh, Muslims in Jammu and Kashmir, no attack on their religious institutions. We have dealt with this problem very liberally in a very democratic manner. And this leadership sitting in Sirinagar doesn't realize what China is doing next door to them in Xinjiang and, and in Tibet. The whole problem is that they want to create an Islamic enclave. I'm talking about the separatists and others, the Islamic enclave in Jammu and Kashmir. And that we cannot accept. And it's becoming worse and worse because all this is linked to the growth of radicalization across the world. So don't look upon what is happening in Kashmir in isolation. There are huge connections and connectivities between what is happening in Jammu and Kashmir and what is happening in the larger Islamic world. So they have a lot of international, international support, so we are fighting a very, very difficult battle. And the more they get radicalized, more difficult it, it is for us to deal with them on that basis because at the end of the day, we are a secular society. We have 185 million Muslims in the country. We can't speak the same language as these separatists. They're highly communal in their thinking, frankly, highly communal. Um, I take your point about China, but I uh, feel like uh, whether or not India has been liberal in Kashmir might be a contentious point. So I'll, I'll uh, take this to you, Mr. Dilla. You know, you seem to be um, a little bit worried about the alienation and the silencing, you've written about this, of uh, Kashmiri voices, and I, I, if I think, uh, if I'm quoting you correctly, the physical and political purge that Kashmiris are facing. And uh, in fact, uh, Mr. Durrani and you, when you were in a conversation before the Pulwama attacks, he spoke about the rising anger and uh, in fact, almost warned against a Fidain attack um, at that point particularly the rising anger in South Kashmir. Now, the Pulwama attacker came from South Kashmir, and according to reports, uh, the uh, 
you know, the terrorist who's been arrested for throwing the grenade in Jammu is also from South Kashmir. Are, are, you, are we missing a trick here by, uh, I mean, do you, do you agree with the ambassador or do you feel like uh, there is more that India can do? Are we missing a trick here by leaving young minds vulnerable to the mischief and propaganda of Kashmir, uh, of Pakistan? I really don't know what and to say days. because I don't know how much time I have because I could speak the whole night on Kashmir, you know. So, but I think we've got it all wrong, you know. I think, not me, India needs to be concerned about the alienation in Kashmir. It has never been so bad. Look at what, what we are doing there. Look at, look at what has happened. Everybody who is somebody with, with political pretensions is under arrest. And the three or four who are out, the governor says they're anti-national. So if everybody in Kashmir is anti-national, then we have no business being there. I think, I think we should just let it go to Pakistan. But that is not the reality. Kashmir is not anti-national. Kashmir is not anti-India. Kashmiris realize that Kashmir is going nowhere. India will never let go of Kashmir. And Pakistan had lost out long ago in Kashmir. You know, at least as far back as 9-11, they knew that it was a losing battle. I have, I have attended umpteen uh, track two meetings with, with Pakistanis, and quite often in recent years, they didn't want to discuss Kashmir. I used to provoke them. I said, what about your core issue? And they said, Chodo, yaar, Kashmir, there is nothing. We have brought back Pakistan in the last two and a half years to, to Kashmir. Now they're having a free ride there. And, you know, the, that boy who, who committed suicide, his father, and uh, the other recent uh, romantic of, of, uh, of uh, terrorism, Buran Wani's father, both have given interviews to the print. I'm sure some people would have seen or heard or read that. Both have made, pleaded, begged, for goodness sake, let's have peace. Let somebody talk to us in Kashmir. Otherwise, we are only going to produce suicide bombers. And yet, I don't think anybody here is willing to listen. You know, I'm reminded of, of a former U.S. Secretary of State during uh, Kennedy's time, Dean Rusk, who said that the best way to deal with your adversary is with your ears. I think we've gone deaf and we've stopped talking. It's, it, it's a shame because Kashmir is in a total mess and Delhi is responsible. Okay, um, I think we have just about five more minutes. Uh, so I'm going to quickly uh, get your views. Uh, there's a lot, like you said, we could speak uh, the whole night about Kashmir and it would still fall short. But to return to the issue of Indo-Pak Indo relations, um, uh, Ambassador, you wrote about uh, the Indus Water Treaty, saying that uh, India would be well within its right to suspend it um, in the wake of the Pulwama attack, something that it's not done before. Why do you feel that it's time, perhaps, to take recourse to that? But if you allow me half a minute, please, just please. to please. give you my thinking about the, talking to the people of Kashmir. Now, what has been said <coughs> by my friend, Dulat, uh, suggests that uh, both the PDP and the National Congress do not represent the people of Jammu and Kashmir. After all, they have been in government, we've been talking to them in running the state. Is it that the only the separatists uh, are the true interlocutors? Now, this is a proposition I think that is, uh, that is quite debatable, but leave it at that. In so far as Indus Waters Treaty is concerned, what I'm saying is that we've not found an answer to uh, Pakistan's involvement in terrorism in India. And there is a genuine fear of escalation. Uh, let's not uh, forget that. So therefore, we must also develop uh, an asymmetrical response. 
and the most potent and non-violent and non-military asymmetrical response is to suspend the Indus Waters Treaty and link it directly and specifically to Pakistan doing, taking actions on the ground which they haven't taken, which is actually outlawing, outlawing the, the terrorist groups, trying their leaders under the Terrorism Act openly so that we know that they are being tried, not simply put in preventive detention and things like that, especially try those who are responsible for the Mumbai attacks and for the Pathan Court attacks, etc., etc. And if they don't do that, then we reserve the right to not observe the uh, provisions of the treaty. And what I'm saying is, look, people are saying, oh, when you talk with the Indus Waters Treaty, you're going to store water to Pakistan. No, because if we are to build dams or barrages on the three western rivers given to them, it'll take years. I'm not saying that. But we have certain rights on those rivers in terms of run of the river projects, which Pakistan constantly impedes, dragging us into appointing a neutral observer or arbitration and making us change the designs against the interests of the projects because we want to be good boys. What I'm saying is go ahead and do your projects with, with no intention to willfully stop water going to Pakistan, but exerting, exer, ex, exercising your right over, as provided un, under the treaty. And it will have consequences of Pakistan because they will they will get the message. And let me conclude by saying the United States walked out of the ABM, they walked out of the INF, they walked out of the climate change, they walked out of the Iran nuclear deal. Why are we hesitant to even suspend, which is simply a bilateral treaty with no international consequences, where the others I mentioned have international consequences? I hope we will progressively work towards that and start sending powerful signals to Pakistan that this can happen and actually do it if next time there's a big terrorist attack. Very short of time, uh, Mr. Dalatsa, but I am going to ask you, um, I'm going to raise a point that you've brought up often, which is that of talks. Uh, you are firmly of the opinion that uh, talks and uh, tier two, uh, track two diplomacy are the only things that can work with Pakistan in the long run. Uh, very quickly, sir, your views on why Vajpayee's outreach and uh, Manmohan Singh's plans uh, who uh, followed closely on the, in the footsteps of Mr. Vajpayee did not co quite come to fruition. I think um, Prime Minister Vajpayee was short of time. If he had a couple of years more, I'm sure things would have moved uh, faster, closer. Don't forget that uh, despite all the provocation, and he was provoked the most, if we look at recent prime ministers, uh, Kargil happened, the attack on parliament happened, the hijacking of 814 happened, and yet uh, Vajpayee had the gumption to, to visit Srinagar and on the 17th of, of April 2003 say that uh, Pakistan has let me down twice, but I'm not going to give up. I'm going to give it a third try. And he did go for the SARC summit in 2004, January. So Vajpayee believed that this permanent confrontation with Pakistan had to end. And his uh, those famous words about Insaniyat, Kashmiriyat, and uh, Jamuriyat are, are still remembered. In, uh, he, if there is one Indian politician who is revered in, in Kashmir, it is Vajpayee. Today, after Pulwama, the new hero there is, is Imran. And all the kids have come out to play cricket now. But there's another point I want to make, uh, a more important point. And that is that, you know, this muscular policy, this operation all out, it will never work. It has not worked anywhere in the world. You know, there is no military solution to a serious insurgency. People at the highest levels have conceded that. And people everywhere have, have talked. You know, recently we had this Norwegian the former prime minister, Bondevik, in, in, uh, in the valley. What he was doing, God alone knows. At whose behest he, he came, we don't know. But the word that the Huriyat sent back with him was that we want peace and we want to
talk. I'm reminded of, of another um, uh, Scandinavian, uh, a Finnish uh, former president, uh, difficult name to, to pronounce, uh, Marty Atahari or something like that, who spent the whole lifetime after retirement talking to terrorists. And he said, that peace requires willpower. And there is no excuse for not giving peace a chance. You must work on it. People everywhere are talking. The Koreans are talking. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Trump has had two rounds of talks with, with, with Kim. Now the Americans are even talking to, to the Taliban. What is our problem in talking to our own people? to the Kashmiris. You don't even talk to Dr. Farooq Abdullah. The man has been uh, chief minister three times. He's been a union minister here. At least he should be consulted on Kashmir. But no, we don't talk. And we don't want to talk to Pakistan. OK, that is the final bell. There is a lot more to discuss, of course. But fortunately, uh, both Ambassador Sibal and uh, Mr. Dulat's books are available. Please do buy them. And uh, you can continue those conversations with the books. Thank you so very much for talking to us.